Hello and welcome along to the RT Rugby Podcast. The World Cup is behind us now and we have our eyes planted on the BKT United Rugby Championship. A big Interpro win for Connacht at the weekend. They are three out of three after their victory against Ulster. Munster and Leinster also picking up wins last weekend. We'll look back on those and look ahead on this weekend. Ulster and Munster at Kingspan Stadium. That's the big game of the week on Friday night. Live on RT2 and RT Player. Connacht away to Edinburgh on Saturday. Leinster away to Dragons on Sunday. That's live also on RT2 and RT Player. With me this week, Bernard Jackman as usual. And also delighted to welcome on former Munster and Leicester wing, Johnny Murphy to the podcast. Morning, fellas. Morning. Morning. We'll um we'll get straight into it, guys, because uh, there's a lot to cover this week between the the Interpros and, and the rest of the games as well. But we'll start with last weekend's Interpro, Connacht's 22-20 win against Ulster, coming from 23 down to maintain their 100% start of the season, the first time in nearly 10 years when they've done that. And Birch, a bit of a a bit of a statement win from Connacht. I know it's very very early in the season, but if you look at how last year went where they lose three in a row away from home to start things out. This time round, three victories out of three, all at home. But it gives them a nice little bit of breathing room heading into a tough run of away games coming up. And when you consider how poorly they've started seasons pretty much regularly over the last 10 years, like it shows that they're a side that generally build as the season goes on. So this is an absolute, absolutely great platform. Yeah, and especially for a new coach, a head coach of Pete Wilkins. I know he's familiar with Connacht. Um, but it just we saw Graham Roundtree last year and the start they had and the negativity and pressure that, that created. Um and in fairness, Munster dealt with it incredibly well. But um it's always a challenge to to do that. So I think Wilkins and, and obviously his new coaching team, which is full of young coaches, you know, Collie Tucker, um, John Muldoon, uh, Scott Fardy and and Mark Sexton. Um, are, are 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 they get instant results? I suppose for for what obviously was a long preseason, and I think speaking to one of the Connacht uh, backroom staff, they said when you're going to make a change like Connacht made and and bring in new voices and try and change things up, a World Cup year is probably the best year to do it because you have an extra long preseason. Plus, to be fair, and and, and they were honest with this, Connacht don't lose a lot of their players for you know for that World Cup preparation as well. So obviously Bundy, uh, Mac and Finley were gone, but they the rest of the lads were there and um it gave them a real chance to to implement what they wanted to do differently. And yeah, the the the, the results were good. That was probably their worst performance of, of all three, to be honest, they even but what was more interesting and remarkable was um the comeback and uh the resilience they showed the Camus they showed and I think Wilkins will be delighted with that and they've got a winnable away game next week in, in Edinburgh I think this weekend um, and then they go to South Africa so uh, they could be in a really good position um, you know they're in a good position now but even next week with the first away game I think they, they definitely would feel that they have the tools to win there Yeah and like Johnny the, the comeback element is a big part of it because we've like I was there at the sports ground on, on Saturday night and People were going there with a good bit of expectation about what Connacht were going to bring against an Ulster side as well that was fairly depleted. And everything was lined up for Connacht to have one of those days that we've seen so often where they come in, there's great expectation after a couple of results and they just let themselves down. And after 44, 45 minutes, it looked like we were getting one of those nights all over again. But to their credit, pulled themselves out of the hole and that's something surely that has to stand for them for the for the next couple of months at least. Yeah, I think it shows kind of a deep belief in what they're trying to do and how they're trying to achieve it. So they never they didn't go off. They obviously had a couple of errors, you know, execution and and things didn't go their way, but they kept kept plugging away. And then you look at when they clicked into gear in that last kind of 20, 25 minutes, the style they played, how good they were, their accuracy levels. Um, it obviously shows that the plan that they're trying to implement, they all have deep belief in it. Um, and everyone with you know with World Cup years, it as Bert has already said, it gives them their opportunity to 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 really, you know, make a mark early in these four or five games while teams aren't are, are missing the majority of their of their internationals. You look at what they did in 2015, and you know, this opportunity that they have now with with three wins, you know, there everything leads to being hopefully four out of four for them. Um, but they've a, 
you know, a good, really good kind of tight, tight core squad of guys that have come through kind of different pathways, uh, some homegrown, um, others from from other academies in the country. And uh, yeah, they just seem to be really kicking on. I know Mark uh, from their attack coach, Mark Sexton, from his work in uh uh, in the school in in the school space and the club space um over in Leinster and he's a top top quality coach and uh that's really starting to show now and they're only you know okay they're you know maybe 12 14 weeks in from a pre-season but you know they're only three games in and it's only going to get better as he layers and layers on on their attack over the next two three months yeah and like uh, on Mark Sexton Birch and, and you did a good piece on against the head on Monday night as well on how sharp Connacht's attack has looked in these first few games as well. But obviously he has a bit of profile because he's Johnny Sexton's brother. But it is great to see an Irish coach getting a gig like that because there has kind of been a... There's been a a lack of Irish coaches getting high-profile gigs in Ireland over the last few years. Yeah, and look, there's a reason for it. I mean, our our coach development... um, Pathway uh, structures is is a, is a bit of a joke. Um, it's been very much neglected under under the last probably the last six seven years. Um, and fellas who who got through it have done it in spite of the system rather than because of it. To be fair, um, uh, and and Sexton has been very driven and focused on on that, uh, on his own personal development. Uh, worked with as Johnny said in Mary School, um, got involved in some of the pathway, uh teams in, in Leinster um, actively upskilled then took the opportunity to move to Galway to go to the Con- Leinster Connacht Academy um, and that's been a really good the academy in Connacht if you think about it you know you have Nigel Carlin you have Jimmy Duffy um, you have Collie Tucker uh, who have and, and now Mark Sexton who have trans uh, have come through there and it's no surprise when you see like um, when coaches go from an academy to senior level they tend to understand better what's there in the system and tend to bring them through, you know, and Connacht now have a lot of good young local players uh, as well. So it's partly down to what they got in the academy in terms of those coaches, but also it helps when you have someone fighting your case um, at selection meetings as well, you know, who's now a senior coach. So I think I think that's great. And, and look, at I said I said on I guess the head, I, I spoke to JJ Hanneran, um, who has been in good clubs. He's been in good clubs. He's been in Munster. Um, he's been in Claremont. He's been in Northampton. And he's been blown away by Mark Sexton. You know, and like, uh, when someone says, speaks that strongly about somebody, um, you know they're good. You know, you know they're good. Uh, so yeah, and then I, in well, fairness, I, I watched the first two games and that, that, that's kind of why I, and I, 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 was, I was excited about their attack and that's why I went out, out went to speak to JJ. Um, and then when he said that, it made me even more interested. So when I put it all together, like, uh, whatever I showed him against the head was two and a half minutes or something like that. But um, originally I had like 13 minutes of very good attack uh, over uh, cut after three games. And obviously that wouldn't work on TV. But uh, that's that was a sign that uh, like there was a lot of good stuff there. And um, there's a lot of good stuff that I would like to show that I had to leave out. So, and that's actually quite a lot over three games, to be honest, you know what I mean, uh, to be fair. So they're doing things right. Um, and, you know, with Jack Carty played on, on Saturday, it continued. Um, and everybody seems to understand, you know, the philosophy and their skill set's good. And look, at, I'm not, we're talking them up here and they deserve to be talked about in a positive way. Do I think they'll be lifting the silverware at the end of the season? Probably not. And I mean, they probably, st- even with Bundy and Mac back in there um, and Finley, obviously they'd be better, but... You know, they probably don't have the the out and out power or depth that the big the big teams do, but certainly um they're making the most of what they have. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the office tomorrow and I'm gonna start petitioning for the Bernard Jackman director's cut to be released. <laughs> the week, week. Rather, I deleted it. I don't the down version that we're getting. No. The people want that will give the people what they want. The problem is, Neil, when you cut everything like I do, you end up uh, being at maximum storage all the time. So uh, <laughs> uh, you, you can you can um, petition for uh, for iCloud for me or something like that. But uh, no, I, I think I think uh, no. Look, no one want to see that thirty minutes, but uh, <laughs> it's just it's just I suppose it's more evidence that they're they're doing good things with the ball. What was what was really good to see, Johnny, as well, was just how aggressive they were, and obviously they were chasing it, but. Like Jack Carty, I thought in those final twenty minutes, twenty five minutes, 
took a lot of big gambles and they paid off. They were three points down. They had a penalty straight in front of the post. Uh, or sorry, no, it, uh, I'm thinking of the first try. They had an opportunity to pull three points back, went for the corner and got their uh, and got their score. Later on, he missed it. You know, later on, they went for it again. They missed the opportunity. He tried to go for three points a few minutes later and missed out. And all those things could have added up and brought a lot of frustration to him and forced some mistakes. But when it came down to those last 10 minutes, got another penalty uh, out around the halfway line and stuck it down into the corner. It was such an aggressive kick at that stage of the game, particularly for someone who's had a couple of mistakes and a couple of calls had backfired. There was some really, really ballsy stuff from Carty and Connacht in those last 10, 15 minutes. You know, it shows great mental resilience and strength to to really push that. But again, as I said already, it shows deep belief in what they're trying to do. And they know that there's obviously an environment there that, you know, Jack has has the, you know, the clearance and the, the backing to go for those big plays, which means that if they don't come off, he'll still be backed up. You know, they'll they'll back him up. And that comes from confidence within uh, within the group and then the confidence that the coaching staff show um show show to the players you know day in day out and they obviously they want to be brave they want to play with the ball in hand um uh, they want to be physical you know if they want to play the quick game that they have you have to look at you know how aggressive they are and how um you know how accurate their breakdown is going to be and that's a big element of of what they're trying to do but you know, they feel that they obviously clearly have a, a view that we're going to be brave and we're going to back ourselves to to get the job done. And that very much came through on uh, at the weekend. And I think that the standout player in these first three games, arguably, potentially across the league, never mind just for Connacht guys, but Kyle Ford, who we've seen plenty of him over the, the last couple of years at this stage, he was a lot of maturity last year when he was the person picked ahead of Bundy Aki when Aki was dropped. And that takes a lot out of a 20, 21 year old uh, at the time. But in these first three games, he's looked really good, constantly getting on the ball, really, really physical in defense. And Johnny, he scored two tries as well. And there's, I said yesterday, he passes the eye test as well, because when you see those tries, they're first phase off set piece and he's coming back against the grain with really intelligent running lines He's not just kind of getting the ball and running straight or, or trying to do everything on his own. He he looks like a really, really mature player for, for someone just 22 years old. Well, this is a prime example of the kind of pathway really working well. You know, like he's a Corinthians, um, you know, a Corinthians player um, again. And what Bert said earlier on, that he's been under Mark Sexton's tutelage for the last couple of years. He's come through that pathway. He's worked very closely with him. But I think, you know, it just shows that um, you know, their pathway is very, very good from both a player and coaching perspective with what they've produced uh, from a coach and now what they're starting to produce as as players within their own path within their own pathway. And uh obviously someone like Mark who has worked with him so closely knows what he's capable, he's seen him every single day, and they're really backing him. And at that age, in a World Cup year, he always knew he was going to, you know, he was involved quite a lot last year, but he knew that that spot was going to be his if he remained injury free for the three, four weeks while Bundy was away. And World Cup years are where players can make careers because, you know, if you're 21, 22 and there's someone away for four or five weeks and they come back and they're a bit sluggish, you've had the start on them and they have to adjust back in. You know, Leicester was the same when I was there for the two for the for for the World Cup years. Uh, Munster was the same. You get an opportunity, and you are first choice. It's clear you're there in those positions because they're gone. That gives you so much confidence, and um, he's very much taken his opportunity over the last 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 three weeks, and he's going to go from from strength to strength. I think, um, but I I just think it's a real credit to the pathway system that they're building in uh in Connacht and it's you know fair juice to them. Can I just come in on that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. It, it actually um probably Connacht and the Connacht Academy deserve more credit for getting the player like Kyle Ford or Jim McCallan or Dylan Tierney Martin, etc. to the level because um effectively and Johnny would know this, Johnny's director will be of Newbridge College, that and the Leinster schools at the moment is 
thanks to me, fellas are coming out of that nearly ready. Like they're 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 technically, tactically, uh, physically in, in a really good place, and you're literally just putting on the last layer of them. Uh, whereas, and this is it's just a function of the of the system down there. And as, I'm not saying unfortunately, but the reality is that the Connacht schools and clubs, they don't have the resource that, that the Leinster schools effectively do. So the, 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 the professional entity Connacht, you know, need to mind them uh, and have more involvement in, in those players outside of what they guess day to day. And, but yet they've been able to, you know, last, last in, in the summer in Cape Town or in Stellenbosch, you know, there was about four, four or it was three Connacht, back, Connacht players anyway in the back line uh, mix who were at the same level as the Leinster, the Munster, or the Ulster players, and in some cases better. So they have done a really good job of filling those gaps where resource wasn't there or the or the national competition structure isn't, the natural competition structure isn't as tense, obviously, as as something like the Leinster schools, which is, is hugely competitive. Yeah, and Johnny, like, I, there's probably a nice incentive, or it, probably an attractive place to go, Connacht, for a young player as well. Like, I use the example of of Kean Prendergast, who I'm pretty sure you would know from from back in Newbridge, he's still in his early twenties. Saturday's game against Ulster that was his fiftieth appearance for the province. So some of those players maybe they might be a little bit disappointed that they that they didn't get a look in with a Leinster Academy or something. But if you if you're a young player going to Connacht and you've got a lot of promise, there is a lot of early first team opportunities available for you where you can really really get a head start. Yeah, the opportunity is there. And then it's just about you taking that opportunity when you get it. You know, Keane is, um, I know Keane very well. You know, his you know, his mental resilience and his mentality is second to none. Uh, his, he's a real standard bearer and standard driver within any environment he's, he, he's in. Um, and yeah, that's kind of for people, you know, even like Jack Anger to get over those disappointments of, you know, not getting a contract in your home province to be able to travel, go and then back it up and then, you know, put, take the opportunity you're given and, you know, there's only so much opportunity you can be given without you having to take it yourself. And that's, that's what the guys go there as they, they take it and, and they run with it and they're clearly backed. You know, there's obviously, uh, you know, they instill a confidence in all these guys um, and the coaches back, back what they have and they consistently, you know, bat above their average. And it's, it's really, really good to see. First, before, finally, before we move on from from Connacht, any other players you just want to mention from these these first three games? Obviously, mentioned Cal Ford and and Keen Prendergast, but and Kane and Blades, Kane, Kane and Blades Blade also as well, yeah. And Dylan Tierney, Dylan Tierney Martin, I think. Um, obviously, Shane Delahunt, who was a great stalwart, has has moved on. Um, Heffernan uh, uh, has an injury, and you know Dylan Tierney Martin. We saw we, we've seen loads of them over the last couple of years, but. Um, is he is he first he's, choice? Is he is he first choice now? When well, Heffernan, he's, we, uh, he's putting up to Heffernan. He's one of the players. Johnny said, you know, you come back from an injury or World Cup, and someone's got a run of games. Certainly, um, he's impressive, uh, and is is more than holding his own, you know. Um, and he's, he's still a youngster, um, with lots of lots of potential to grow. And then I think Caelan Blade, you know, obviously last year we saw him pass out Kieran Marmiam and and win that battle, which had been. They've been going neck and neck for about four or five years. Um, the criticism or the the concern about Ken Blade was his passing game back in the day, but I think his pass has improved um a lot. But not many can do what he can do, ball in hand. Um, like he is, he is a, a proper breaking uh, running nine. And yeah, I I think when he plays for Connacht, obviously he got it looked like quite a serious injury, so I'm not sure if he's going to fit this weekend. But he's been amazing for them in the in the two and three quarter games he's played. Right, Ulster. We we'll move on to them now. It it was a strange game from their point of view because it was probably closer than some people thought it was going to be when the teams were announced. But then obviously you have the the massive frustration from being seventy or twenty points to thir- twenty points to three ahead early in the early in the second half. Do you take? Uh, how do I put it? Is the second half collapse, Johnny? Is it a bit more understandable when you step back and take a look at the long list of availabilities they had? Is it a little less frustrating than it might have been on another day, considering 
how many inexperienced players were out there? Or is it still just like if you're head coach, for example, that day, is it still just as frustrating? I think it's still just as frustrating with the, on the day, but then when you sit back and look at it as an over uh, as an overall, you have to take in everything you've just said, the amount of guys that are injured, uh, the internationals that are away. Um, but you would hope that a team that goes twenty three up is has the ability to close the game out, um, and that probably comes with inexperience. Um, you know, being that up, do they do they switch off? And then they switch off clearly and give Connacht the opportunity to get back into games, be it through penalties, uh, you know, in between those tens, which allows Carthy, for instance, kick in, you know, that absolute screamer of a penalty to the corner. Um, that comes with inexperience and not being able to to close to close those games out. So hopefully from an ultra perspective, they can really learn from that. Um and take that into uh, into this weekend. But it is it's always hard when you're missing your internationals and then you have a long list of in, a long list of injuries on top of all that. It can be very, very difficult um for uh for any squad to manage that. Um but you know they've guys that are 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 are, are stepping up that have kind of earned their trade in in the AIL over the last couple of last couple of years be it Jake Flannery or uh, Dave McCann who's played a lot with Bambridge but they still have to be able to to close that out and I think that would be the biggest thing on a review that you know when you get 17 points up you you need to kick on and just close that out Yeah Bert Johnny mentioned Dave McCann and he's someone I wanted to to talk about as well Um, he was on the bench obviously on Saturday but came on after a couple of minutes after that uh, that injury to, to Ruben Crothers Um. He looks like he's going to another level now this year. He's someone who's, who's yeah. been around a good bit in the last year or so and has kind of built up his bit of experience. But when you look at the wider Ulster squad now, when you're picking a first choice back row week on week, he's right in that mix, isn't he? Yeah, I think he's ready. I, I think he's ready. And look, he got his chance obviously early because of the injury to, to Ruben Crowder, who again is someone that is pushing there. So probably for four or five years, we were concerned about it being very much Ulster backs coming through um from the academy with you know uh, and lots of them and there was no forwards but now we've got two back rows I think in McCann and Crothers who um who look really exciting and, and particularly I suppose McCann who we've seen a bit more of um and I, I think you're right I think he will be very much in that rotation for first team places um in that back row and, and obviously um Dave Ewers was out last weekend um Ulster would probably need him to to be a big impact, have a big impact um, as that big ball carrying uh, forward that they obviously lost when they did when they lost Marcel Cotsia, replaced him with something different with Vermeulen, but I think they need that. Um, uh, and McCann, McCann's not the type of player, but he is, he, he's very strong in, in, in kind of all areas. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see what Dan McFarland does with him and, and who he, who he shares game time with or who he replaces. Yeah, they're looking a lot healthier this week in terms of personnel for taking on Munster and a short turner and as well, Ian Henderson, McCloskey, Herring back, Balakoon, John Cooney, Ewers is back as well, Kieran Treadwell. So they should be able to put out a, a pretty good team. Are they are they in a bit of trouble, though, Birch, around tight head at the moment for the short term where Tom O'Toole and Marty Moore both out injured James French, who's pretty inexperienced, is out for this weekend as well. And that leaves them with uh, Greg McGrath, Andy Warwick probably swapping over to tight head. Mm. And then someone like Ben Griffin, who's a promising player, but straight out of the AIL. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a huge worry for him. I thought they got away with murder in the scrum the weekend. I thought French um, French was very lucky and, and uh, uh, they survived. Uh, and actually, probably one of few penalties that are, are penalty and free kick that I don't think they deserve. But um, you know, with him being out again and going down a little bit lower into it, Warwick moving across is far from ideal. Uh, I, and I think realistically, I think it's a sign of of maybe financial pressures that they're going to go into this season with the the props that they have. Obviously, Kitchoff's coming in is a, is a big signing on the other side, um, but. Realistically, yeah, I don't know if they have the depth across because you're going to get injuries in, in in the front row, and obviously Hooker they're incredibly well stacked. Um, and Lou said you could argue that they're 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 they'll be fine. 
Uh, but I'd say on the other side, um, uh, that they're definitely going to be in trash. I, I'd say if Dan McFarland had his way, they'd be looking to get a medical joker in now, just for the next two or three months, you know, because um, you just can't be that light and expecting players to step up from AIL and be able to compete. You know, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a lovely surprise when they do. Um, uh, but uh, particularly a player, a young player, um, it's it's a at tighter prop is a is a big big ass. So that'd be a big concern for Man. Sure, an area that Munster will look to uh, to to target in a big way. The the wider the wider point with Ulster this season, Johnny, like two wins out of three. Decent enough start. You know the the win against Zebra wasn't particularly impressive, but did well against the Bulls. If they can get a win this weekend against Munster with a lot of players back, they're still looking in very very good shape. But is there is there an element of kind of this is a bit of a make or break season for them, considering the journey they've been on over the last few years, uh, a few near misses along the way, they'd built up from a fairly low ebb when Dan McFarland came in to the point where they were challengers for a title but we're still really struggling to take that final step and if you look at the the squad that's there the talent they have in the back line is there an element that this is the year that it has to come together or otherwise you're probably just going to start going on that that down slope uh, yeah I completely agree I think they're kind of always um, there thereabouts but they need to take the, the, the next step they've been like that even since I was playing they were always kind of in and around kind of, you know, semifinals or quarterfinals, but never actually kind of got to to pull the trigger on it. And I think, you know, the fans up there and also, you know, the background, the the senior management, they need to see some type of reward in terms of, you know, silverware. Uh, it's going to be hard for them, but I think that they have the quality, the names that you mentioned there that are starting to return. You know, they're the the majority of the spine of their team now. That should allow them to to kick on a bit um, and push towards that that kind of playoff position in the URC. But I do think it's kind of now or never for them um, because they've been close enough, but still very very far away. So they need to to take that next step and 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 push on to, to try and get some medals around their neck. That leads us on to, to Munster, who are heading to Belfast this Friday night. And Johnny, like it has all the makings of an absolute belter of an Interpro when you consider Ulster will be hurting after last week. They're getting a good few players back into their squad. And with a home game, you presume most of them, most if not all of them, are going to be playing this weekend. Graham Roundtree was kind of non-committal. He was a bit coy yesterday about how many of their internationals are going to play. But you'd have to assume... Some of them will be will be coming in this weekend. So it's um after a good interpro last week, it feels like the the stakes are just going to be ramped up a little bit more again on Friday night. Yeah, I think so. And like it's always nice to get back in after we're we're a cup year, get back into an interpro if you are coming back in, it gives you something to kind of that's a high level. So I'm not sure how many will be available. I think a couple of the lads were still on holidays last week, the guys who started. So, um, you know, um, but there will be some entries back in. Um, Munster are, are, are going well. Um, you know, I think there was a lot made of their kind of draw over in Italy, but at this time during a World Cup, it can be a difficult enough place to go and and get a win. And, you know, it can be a difficult place any time of year to, to go and get a win. So, um, I think they're in a good spot. They're they've improved again for 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 in my opinion. Um, and I think they're going to be contenders. But this stage of the year, with everything that happened last week with Ulster, I think they have an opportunity to go and get a statement win so early on with not a full you know not a full team, but go up to Ravenhill, difficult place, and 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 get a win, which I think would be, you know, which would lead into. You know they've got the Stormers after, and then they've Leinster away, which is the one tough run of fixtures coming up. Like yeah, tough, tough run of fixtures, um, you know, and then Glasgow at home. But they, you know, I think this this one is is one that they they will target. You know, a few few guys coming back into the fold. But yeah, they're in a they're in a good spot, um, and I think that they'll they'll. Uh, I think it's going to be a tight game, but uh, but I'd fancy them to go up and do a job up there. Mm. And Birch, like you mentioned, Ulster would 
potentially be looking at getting in a, a medical joker as tight head prop. Do you think Munster would be considering trying to get some sort of a short term signing at out half? Tony Butler, obviously, Joey, Joey Carberry's out for a few months. Uh, you Jack Crowley, obviously, who's going to be starting. Tony Butler did a decent enough job at the weekend, but but even still, you're still operating with just two out halves. And if if one of Butler or Crowley gets an injury, you're in a good bit of trouble. Okay, you've Rory Scannell who can cover. Antoine Frisch played with the Barbarians at out half during the summer, but you're not really sure how how long term an option that would be. Do you think they'd just be keeping an eye to see what's out there for? A two three months. Yeah, look, I think the problem is uh, they don't, lots all the provinces would love to be able to dip into that, but it's 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 at the moment it's no, it's not not out. So um, there's no point. There's no point looking over the over the uh, over the fence. Uh, something you can't have. So um, no, they, uh, John, Johnny Sexton is not going to make an emergency. Signing. Uh, I mean, the only red anyway. I don't think that would be some turnaround. That'd be the turnaround of all turnarounds. Um. No, it's uh no, they're not they're not allowed from what I understand. So they'll have to kick on. Uh, Butler's a good young player. Um, the problem if you play Frisch at ten is is they probably want to play him in the center with uh, Nankabil. So, um, and then you're basically burning up game time uh, on him in a position that he's probably not going to play the big games in. So I think it'll be Scannell. Um, next the will be the next option. Um, yeah, I I agree with Johnny. I think Munster. You know, they went through the pain of obviously changing how they want to train, play, etc., and had all that injuries and and struggled with getting it right. And then once they clicked, um, it, it obviously led them to a URC. And I think if you're an Ulster fan, like probably for for two or three years, their Ulster were ahead of Munster. I think in terms of the next best to Leinster, and they didn't capitalize on that. They didn't pick up that trophy that Munster obviously have now. And um, uh, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what that does for Munster Rugby. Um, they have a big high profile game, uh, coming up again, haven't they, this year? Um, in Park, yeah, in Parky Creeve, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, like, that's you know, that, that that's that's massive, you know, it's massive because, like, um, that's effectively what well, North Champ North versus South champions, uh, in hemispheres. It'll be a huge night. A uh, huge game. Uh, we saw, I think, the, the game against South Africa last year in Parky Creeve was massive for them, you know, massive for them in terms oh, of... Oh, and I, getting... I was there, it was like, yeah. it was a, the weather was brutal, but it was a roaring success. Yeah, yeah. and like, honestly, it's, it's amazing how things like that can just kickstart things, um, change the whole perception of of what what's going on. Um, the team that night, obviously, were shorn of internationals, but played incredibly well, and, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that are happening for Munster that, that you would like. Obviously, on the other side of the coin, I mean, the injury to RG Snyman is is a massive blow, you know. Um, and there's a bit of talk about John Klein being a target for Leon, etc. But in general, I think Munster are in a in a in a really good place, despite the, obviously the the concerns around ten as well in, in terms of injury. Yeah, and like on the second row issue, as you said, RG Snyman is out for what Graham Rowntree said is going to be months rather than weeks. Um, John Klein, kind of uncertainty around his his long term future there beyond the end of this season. Interest from Leon reportedly, but Roundtree gave the impression they're going to be doing whatever they can to keep him. But on the flip side, the performances, Johnny, of Edwin Adogbo and Tom Ahern over the last few weeks shows and, and throw Ty Byrne in there, who's who's back as, as of this week. Um, They're fairly well stocked in the second row, as, as much as a, a blow as it is to lose someone like Orgy Snyman. They're, they're still looking very, very healthy there. And Tom Ahern is someone who... Just he looks like he's beefed up over the last few months. Pretty much missed out on all the last season due to a shoulder injury. And to hear what Graham Rowntree was saying about a dog bow yesterday, um, I haven't heard him speaking about a player, uh, with such potential in in the last few years that he's been there. There's a lot coming through there at second row. Yeah, and I think that that's that's a really you know they have depth there, you know, and they have opportunity. And sometimes you just have to invest in youth and give them their opportunity and, and go on. So same and injury. Yes. It's, that is a big blow for them. Um, John Klein, I don't, you know, the reality is, is are they going to be allowed to keep him because he's a non-qualified player? Probably not. They already have a, a non-Irish qualified player in that position. So, it depends from an injury profile, what happens with Snayman and whether you're going to keep him or not. But they have two really good young second rows that are hungry and 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 have an opportunity to 
to to kick on with. So, you know, that's again another good thing of the pathways that people have previously been given out about Munster that their pathway wasn't good enough and they were fishing in other kind of ponds, um, for, uh, for fords and 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 stuff. So I think that this this shows that their pathway is starting to to produce good players that are able to play. And you're not going to find out whether these guys are going to mix it with the top level or not, unless they, um, you know, unless you give them the opportunity. There's a couple of really good young second rows uh, as well at lower underage stuff. Um, I've coached kind of an 18s, uh, 18s development side. There's really good young second row there um, and a couple other at under 20 levels. So they have they have a really good depth chart there across all age groups. So, you know, it's, I think it's time that they give them their opportunity and, uh, and invest in the, in the youth. Yeah. And Bernard, particularly as well with a Hearn and a dog, but they're the, they're physically the kind of players that we don't produce a lot of in Ireland. A Hearn is six foot eight and you see him this season. He is, he certainly has filled out more than he was two years ago. If you hold up pictures side by side, and we see a dog bus still just, I think, 21 years old, but he's just physically an absolute nuisance around the breakdown. Yeah, absolutely. Two two players that that without a doubt have the physical attributes um to be top quality internationals. And look at we've we've known about Tom Ahern for a couple of years. Um uh a dog bus we 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 saw on the big stage last year a little bit, um, but obviously highly touted for for lots of, for a long time from from his time in the Cove Pirates all the way through. People were saying, "Watch this kid! Watch this kid!" So, um, and and yeah, they've got two senior internationals, uh, three senior internationals technically ahead of them, but it's enough games during the season for for all the provinces to to bring those through, you know. And I think round three. Roundtree will do what's best for them. Um, and I think Tom Ahern would have been, would we would have seen more Tom Ahern's if Tom Ahern if he didn't have those niggles that he's had. But to be fair, when he's been fit uh, and there's been opportunities to play them, so uh, yeah, it's it's exciting. It's really exciting because they're the type of, of, of like I said this before, you don't need to produce twelve players out of your academy every year uh, who can play URC. Um, are you, the the key thing is how many of them can you produce that can become. Champions Cup players, you know, uh, in, in your team. That's the, like, one or two of them every year and the coaching staff will, will be delighted. Uh, and both those have that profile um, that they could be Champions Cup players at the very least and, and potentially good internationals. Yeah. And while we're on the, the topic of good young players with massive futures, I might just move it on to Leinster because we're, we're running out of time a bit. Mm-hmm. But um, Jamie Osborne, he... Missed the first game of the season, but came in against the the Sharks and Edinburgh at the weekend. Player of the match against Edinburgh, and Johnny, we were talking off air before we started, and like you've he, he's someone you know quite well through through um the underage stuff and through through Nace Rugby Club as well, and um he just looks like a player who's who's got it all. Like he's six foot four, seventeen stone. He can kick the ball an absolute mile. He's light on his feet. He's He's a complete package kind of a player, isn't he? Yeah, he is. And from the very first time that I would have coached Jamie was uh, kind of the COVID year in the AIL. Um, uh, he actually played for Leinster before he played for for Nace in the AIL. He's only one cap for 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 Nace. Um, but automatically when he came down training, he picked up things instantly. Uh, he's one of these players that you don't think he's traveling that fast, but he just glides across the ground, covers so much ground. Uh, defensively, his reads are excellent. Um, and he's a left foot, which opens up, um, you know, the other side of the pitch. Um, and yeah, he just, just gets it. Um, and he's big, strong lad, as you said, um he's he's a real um he's a real rugby kind of student like he would have spent a lot of time you know even on our huddle platform in terms of um you know watching trying to get up to scratch on calls and plays um you know there's a timer that shows how much time someone can will view stuff on huddle his was always when he was with us was always uh the highest by a long long way um 
yeah, I can't speak highly enough of him. Um, and he's he's a great lad as well. But I think you know this is now time where you're going to see him really excel and cement himself for four year for four years time within that kind of World Cup frame and World Cup cycle. Um, and I think you know he can really kick forward and hopefully get a couple of caps over the next kind of uh, year or so. And then uh, and then it's where you play him. You know, is he going to be that number 23 when everyone is fit because he covers from 12 out? Um, does that help him? It helps him in a World Cup year, but does it help him in every other year where he plays a lot of URC but comes off the bench in a lot of Heineken Cup games? Um, or does he get the opportunity to to, your, to usurp the centres that are ahead of him or, um, you know, or, or, or at fullback? It's that's that's one thing. So that's that's the only thing that, even though it's a huge strength, being so versatile is probably something that can go against them when it comes to selection for, um, you know, for starting. Where do you see Neil, Neil Birch? I want to go on the record here. Uh, oh, the All Blacks have the Barrett's. We have the Osbournes. There's more coming. There's more coming. They only they only got three three of their family to be All Blacks at the same time. Well, watch for the for the Osborne, the Osborns making up a, 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 most of a backline in years to come. There's a couple more coming, isn't there, Johnny? So we've, yeah, we've Andrew, uh, Andrew was Andrew was twenty. Yeah, no, no, I'm talking about the lowest. Who's, who's, Andrew who's coming and, as well. Who's coming, coming after? Well. Andrew, their youngest brother is actually the same age as my son. He's uh, he's quite he, he's uh, seven or eight. He, he's in Nice Minis, um, and uh, without putting pressure on him, he's he he he's well able to move. Anyway, that's all I'll say. <laughs> But there's another Johnny, isn't there? Is there someone? Is it for them? For them. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I yeah. don't think I'm sure for, but yeah. Oh, there is another. I, I think there is at, at youth. That at, at yeah. Youth. Yeah. 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 I believe he's very good as well. Now look at it. It'll be amazing. So Jamie, Jamie set the he's set the path. Uh, and it's interesting. You know, I think Brian O'Driscoll played um, played for for Ireland before he played for Leinster. I think uh, James Ryan did something. Similar and the fact that you know yeah, Jamie Osborne had played, he played, for, played for Leinster before he played AI. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and Jamie obviously you said played for Leinster before he played for 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 Nay. So, um, yeah, the, uh, there's no coincidence that those guys. And look at the problem for Jamie is obviously he's in, he's in a very competitive area full of world class players, both at Province and, and for Ireland. But um, every time you see him play, uh, he he stands out, doesn't he? Yeah. And yeah. where where would you see his best position being, Birch? I think in the center, yeah. I'm, um, I think, yeah, maybe twelve, maybe twelve, twelve, probably. Um, we're pretty much out of time. We'll get in more into what Jack Nienaber is going to do with Leinster. I'd I'd say next week because there's a lot to a lot to talk about in that. But across these first couple of three games, obviously, Birch Leinster have used a lot of inexperienced players and two wins out of three I think is a reasonable enough return from us two home wins one away defeat scored plenty of tries have looked really good at times have looked a little bit scrappy at times but probably to be expected with the with the players they have any any more of those younger players that have kind of hopped out for you yeah well, I thought Byron I thought Lee Byron the hooker was very good at the weekend um and uh the challenges again he's it's pretty Pretty strong in, in in that area, which with Sheen, um, with Kelleher, with with McKee, uh, but he he did really well. Uh, I, I you know I like both loose heads a lot, Jack Boyle and Paddy McCarthy. Um, they're the you know they're the ones. Obviously, Tommy O'Brien we know about Max Deegan we know about, and they've been excellent. Uh, but it's probably those yeah I would say those three front rowers, Baron, uh, McCarthy and and Boyle, um, are players that maybe not this season, but in time we we'll, we'll see a lot of. Johnny, last last word to you. Anyone you want to kind of name check from those those few Leinster games? Yeah, well, I think obviously uh, I'd know the the front row guys quite well. Obviously, they would have played against us in in, in school. Mm. Uh, they're you know they're they've been uh, kind of probably a streets ahead of guys for since they've probably been 16, 17, 18. And you look at their cup campaign, what they did over those years. Um, so I would have always then, and then obviously. You know, there's a lot of talk about someone 
that's been around, you know, last number of year. But for me, obviously, and my connection with the movie Sam Prendergast and and how and where he can where he can potentially get to in this period and and what's going to happen to him over the next eighteen months. Um, he'd be the obviously the kind of standout for me. But that's just because of my personal connection with him. Um, but yeah, the the two props are 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 lads that I would have not enjoyed watching play against us. Um, but they've been they've been head and shoulders above uh, above a lot of people in their age grade. So I think it's going to, as Bert said, take a probably a couple of years, but they're, they're two to things so along with Sammy. Very good. Um, Finally, before we wrap up, didn't get a prediction on Munster and Ulster uh, this Friday night for me. Very quickly, who's going to win that Interpro on Friday night? Bert, I'll go with you first. Munster. Johnny? Yeah, same. Munster, I think, will win, yeah. Okay, two wins for Munster. Well, that game is live on RT2 and RT Player Friday night, as is Leinster away to the Dragons on Sunday afternoon. We'll be back for more on the RT Rugby podcast this time next week. Thanks to Johnny and Birch as usual. And we'll speak to you again soon.